three COPs, okay, from Ukraine. We have Senya Sidorkina, Chief of Party of the USAID Agriculture Growing Rural Opportunities Activity, Agro, in Ukraine, just saying. Uh, and we have also with us from Lebanon, Sami Hairala, Deputy Chief of Party of the USAID Agriculture and Rural Empowerment Activity. I am stressing Lebanon, okay? And we have from the Horn of Africa, Jebiwat Sumbewo, Chief of Party of the Feed the Future Cross-Border Community Resilience Activity. Uh, as you see, you know, those who know and follow the news understand that our group here are working in challenging environments. They're demonics project leaders whose teams implement development in the face of shocks. I guess you got that, okay? And the war in Ukraine, the Lebanon economic crisis, the drought in the Horn of Africa, and now the floods. So, as you know, today's development work needs to cope with shocks, yet keep the development momentum going. Okay? And today's session is entitled The Art of the Pivot. And that's a take on, of course, well, maybe not, of course, maybe you don't know, on The Art of War, the famous book by General Sun Tzu, okay, who put together a series of simple quotes on how to deal with adversity, okay? And uh, let's understand that you know, we will not be talking about waging war but rather how to deal with chaos and chaos that comes with conflict. And conflict, economic crisis, pandemics, and climate change. Now, Sun Tzu's little phrases, for those who know the book, okay, are echoed, for example, by the U.S. Marine Corps' guideline to, when everything breaks down, keep moving, seek the high ground, and stay in touch, okay? Now, these phrases are called heuristics, okay? Heuristics are rules of engagement, their guidance to navigate chaos, okay? Now, Sun Tzu also says, a very short quote, says that, in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. And, you know, market systems approach can actually be adapted to chaotic contexts. And heuristics, for those who follow that literature, are actually an integral part of the response of developing a market-driven response to chaotic contexts. Because these heuristics, are actually little rules that work when nothing else works and response time is essential. So it's actually a very serious domain. And uh, what they what they consider concern was you know they they concerned very loose concepts such as flexible boundaries and priorities developing new response teams, developing rapid feedback systems, repurposing radically your assets, and controlling your learning cadence. Okay, all this for the, to meet this keep moving, seek the high ground, stay in touch, and other such heuristics. And so when I, I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking, this is essentially practical. And we can be very theoretical and do a whole bunch of graphs and diagrams, and there are a lot of those. But I'd rather ask the implementers themselves to come and tell us when they got caught in that deer in the headlight moment of a massive shock, how did they react? How did they pivot? And how did they, they regroup and redeploy? And this is what they will be telling us today, explaining to us their method, their approach, and we're going to get the profile from three different situations. And let's see if we can make sense of this. Is there a method 
is there an approach? So with no more further ado, I'll pass the mic to Ksenia to tell us about the Ukraine adventure. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I slept two hours. I think many of you slept not more, so let's try to keep it a little dynamic. Uh, I have my colleagues who are instructed to cut me off if I get carried away because I am very passionate about our program in Ukraine. Uh, so I wanted to just start by saying that it is a privilege to be here today with you and along with my colleagues and to speak about some of the challenges that we face that are beyond the normal challenges of development programming. Ooh, I used to think that we had it hard before. Uh, so uh, where's, uh, can I have a clicker? I lost the clicker, sorry. I can do that, thank you. So I want to start by uh, just providing a little bit of a context for uh, where Ukraine is right now, what happened and where it left uh, USAID programs and other donor programs, uh, the challenges that arose and what we're trying to achieve in this new era of uh, war, post-war, during war shocks. Uh, and how that also reflects on the global food security. So uh, there's a bit of a graph uh, that you can have a better sense of what happened because of the war. And we're looking at uh, over 25% of Ukraine's territory being occupied, which of course had devastating effects on global uh, exports. Uh, Ukraine accounts for all of those magnificent number of exports globally of wheat, maize, and other crops. Uh, there's uh, a number of countries that do depend severely for global food security on the imports from Ukraine. So uh, the ripples of the war in Ukraine, uh, I think, shook the whole world. And our program was put in front of center of addressing not only the shocks and the consequences inside the country, but also outside. Uh, and as we are speaking right now, the shocks aren't stopping. We're also looking at the words, a recurring shock, that something that continues to happen in Ukraine every day. And as we speak, Ukraine is only starting to assess the uh, impact of the latest terrorist act uh, with the flooding that caused devastation and uh, flood, flood by now like around 50,000 people that are impacted. But more importantly, is a huge percent of the territory for agriculture. Uh, the other important aspect is understanding the operational environment, which doesn't get any easier. My team is amazing, hiding in shelters during the night and day, and still continues to operate, hiding from the bombing, hiding from uh, occupational forces, and yet we continue to deliver. So this is the environment that we found ourselves in over a year ago, and it doesn't get easier. Uh, so... Before I move on to describing exactly what the program is doing right now on the ground, I think it is important to speak about some limitations and uh, give the operational context that what we are dealing on the ground when trying to reprogram and pivot during the times of shock, there are a few things that we need to account for. First is the speed of intervention. We are not as quick as business, right? Rules and regulations and procedures, they still apply. No matter how fast we want to move, how fast we want to change the course of our program, there are still those limitations. And uh, we need to keep that in mind and find mechanisms how that can be overcome. And for us, that has always been partnering with businesses, with people on the ground. They'll move faster and we need to find those partners, find those champions, and accelerate the assistance that comes at the grass uh, grassroots level. Um, the other big limitation is availability of data. When the shock comes, you know that something horrible is happening. You have no ways to assess it. So this is where you, again, lean on the local partnerships because this is the best and shortest way to get the data that you need to at least start to plan to pivot to change the programs. Uh, the other one is the security concerns. Uh, that's quite an obvious one, but I'll give you another example that's not as obvious. For Ukraine, the security concerns also led to closure of all data. So uh, for the enemy not to be able to get all of the sensitive information, all the registries were closed, all the geodata was closed. So everything disappeared, making it even harder to make data-driven decisions. And this is, again, when you lean on the local partners network, when you lean on the government, 
You also see them all together because their data doesn't match. Once uh, one tells you, okay, we need this, the government partner will tell you something entirely different. So then you also work as a broker between all of these multiple engines, trying to figure out, so what is it exactly that we are going to do? Uh, and finally, finally, is the dynamic environment. So uh, things change all the time. You could have decided that we are going to, let's say, buy power generation uh, generators. By the time we got them, the power is restored and we have floods and we need pumps and boats. And by the time that we're going to buy them, the water will dry and we'll need something else. So uh, understanding the dynamic environment, which makes it so much harder to plan as we were used to, right? Having the inception periods and work planning periods and, and implementation plans and mail plans attached to that, that just goes out of the window. So uh, you need to start to, to adapt your own thinking to planning with no regrets. That's basically this slide is the bulk of the what and how we changed and how we started operating differently. Uh, the first cycle of adaptation of programming was assessing of the types of interventions that are necessary. And uh, in our context, we've identified that uh, there's also the timeline and the different types of territories that we're dealing with. So we broke them out into immediate response, early recovery, and rebuilding. So long-term rebuilding better. And given the fact that Ukraine is not a homogenic situation, so to say, we have occupied territories, we have territories with active hostilities, and we have safer areas. So uh, based on the regions, you need to also understand that you kind of have to adapt that three-faceted approach on needs basis. And that is also a dynamic situation because once some territories get liberated, the immediate response kicks in. Some territories that have been liberated for a while, this is where you start thinking about rebuilding. And then they're being shelled again. So do you go and invest or you wait? So a lot of those moving pieces also play into the scenario of how, and how you plan and what you plan and how much you're gonna invest in a particular area, given the risk profile, the other, the other structural uh, approach that we took was looking at the partnerships. And as I said, and I mentioned it already three times, partnerships is important. This is your foundation for making sure that you are effective on the ground. But looking at how you can expand the pool of partnerships was fundamental for us to achieve results. And here, and as intended, that represents a pyramid. You can also imagine that that sort of reflects the scale and uh, the outreach to the partners. So I'll say that traditionally we were here, SMEs, helping them in traditional value chains that needed more support, dairy, fruit, veg, aquaculture, craft producers, uh, the industry that really required a lot of TA. With the breakout of the war and the global food security focus, we needed to be here because here, that's the 40% of all Ukraine's grain export. So without working with those large enterprises, it is impossible for us right now to even entertain the idea of rebuilding better. So uh, breaking it out into such a pyramid, there are groups of partners. And with each group of partner, we identify their systemic constraints, their new needs, and look how we can best leverage all of those partners on the ground. So just to give you examples, and I'm not going to go over everything that we do with every partner, but large enterprises are now uh, the driver, the main champion for rebuilding. So we are willing to co-invest with those companies to rebuild their infrastructure that they lost during the war. Uh, we want to invest with them to go into more value added processing of goods to create value addition, but also to lower the pressure on export. And by doing so, let's remember, we still love our market systems approach. We want to do that, but in a smart way and still incentivize these companies to change their behavior and incorporate the SMEs into those form of value chains. So not just we want to support them and de-risk their rebuilding of their own businesses, we want to do it in a smart way so that they can integrate SMEs in their production. And by this, 
include them in the export chains. By this, include them in the value addition chain. So we are trying to still make that development change even during the times of war. Uh, it's more or less understandable with the SMEs. We kind of do the same with the larger companies, with the small and medium producers, we try to go into stimulating their processing capabilities, which is interesting. As Jean-Michel started by saying uh, shocks, it's about the risks and opportunities. And this is where we see that with the small producers, with medium producers, the war has really become that opportunity and a pain point. They are more willing to invest, if you can imagine, than they used to be before. And quoting one of our partners, we used to be rich by just selling grain. We didn't need anything else. We didn't need to bother to do anything else. And here, once we lose the channels, once we lose the production, once we lose our export, we need to think about alternatives. And yes, as painful as it is, we have to invest right now to survive. And this was the notion that was important for us to understand, to think about how we structure our assistance Further and investing with those companies and de risking their business was our way to say, okay, this is how we're going to lean on you and help you survive and get better. And then, never forgetting that there is also government and civil society and the whole ecosystem, which is super important for us to stay in touch, to get the information necessary, but also coordinate and collaborate with multiple actors, creating those multiple feedback loops and making sure that we stay on track. I had a private sector example, but I'll get to it because I think uh, I'm running over time. So I'll, I'll keep this for later, if necessary. Uh, so at this point, the key tip is, uh, I've put up a few examples of things that we did and how we changed the, uh, those activities that we already had because we didn't start the program to address the needs that emerged out of the war. We pivoted and all of our governance activities, so anti-corruption efforts, all of that we changed to the war environment. And with this, for instance, we had with drones, we just had like a, a learning pilot demonstration fields. When the war broke out, we changed their scope into actually uh, doing pesticide works and other necessary works to support the farmers in the, the fields. Uh, we've also established a relocation centers supporting businesses who needed to escape occupation. We had the hotline for relocation. Uh, we started initiatives on documenting war crimes for businesses. There was a, a huge number of activities that we either launched or repurposed the existing mechanisms that we had. And that again, addressed the speed of intervention. Because if we waited to launch new procurements, new programs, we would have missed that momentum, which we didn't want to do. So we've, uh, we have associations of communities, we have associations of farmers, we've repurposed all of our agreements with them to address the new challenges, like um, getting the critical inputs to farmers, uh, getting even some humanitarian assistance, which we didn't pay for because we are development and we can't, but we paid for the ecosystem we paid for the logistics and we've helped our partners on the ground to rebuild those routes that then served multiple purposes. Uh, I do want to say that to underline how dynamic the situation is, by now as we are speaking today, we've already had several iterations of decisions that we made with businesses, with our investment partners. We've had companies under occupation. One of them, my favorite is a dairy business, very innovative, uh, doing like baby food. And uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's so innovative. When I saw it looks like spaceship inside. Uh, Unfortunately, all of that was destroyed. Uh, while under occupation, the woman owner of this business, she basically, dis uh, not destroyed, but repurposed all of her fodder, milled it and baked bread to help the local population survive. Then she and her husband were forced out of that farm and uh, the occupational forces completely took over. Right now, she returned to her business when the territory was liberated. And we relaunched our activities together with this company and trying to support her and her business to restart the activities. So this, again, the dynamism of the situation and reassessment of the situation on the ground is key to continue to refocus interventions and sometimes 
those changes are just too much, but this is what you have to do. In red, I think this is the biggest takeaway out of all of our last year and a half is build new partnerships, build on existing partnerships, continue co-investing with these partners, de-risk their own investments to deliver whatever assistance we need. And I will note that uh, because of those shocks and because of the pain points, our co-investment ratio actually doubled. So right now, and this is a very, uh, Victoria will kill me because uh, that's not really a data-based number, but uh, more or less we are looking at one, one to three dollars to of co-investments. So to our $1 of investments, businesses are investing three. When we're talking about companies that are willing to invest millions and millions of dollars during the war in Ukraine, this is amazing. It's inspirational. And all we can do is share those risks with them and they're gonna run. So they are the key driver. So my main takeaway, work with partners, work with businesses, and help them make the necessary change. Because we, as development assistants, we are not the center of the solution. We are the catalyzing force, and that's it. So we need to find those drivers and who to run with. Uh, so the main change, but I've touched upon that already, was the change to global food security. And this was just the major refocus of our activities, shifting from traditional value chains to supporting production and processing of grains. And there are just a few things that we launched uh, as the support to this sector, which we never supported before. And I'll stop at the lessons learned here, just for the sake of time. And I think we can cover, if you have questions, specific interventions sometime later in the Q&A. So um, our main lessons, as stated here, the foundation of the development assistance in our experience uh, has always been the market systems approach. Work with the market, market actors, look at the systemic constraints, but you might question that, is it really relevant when there's shock and you need to save people and it's more of a humanitarian disaster? I will say absolutely. That's exactly the approach that helped us see the opportunities, not missing a beat, seeing where the new issues were, seeing where the new partners were, but yet uh, adapting to the same context and building our assistance on the partners that were already there, knowing much better than we, all the 50 people you can imagine in the program might assume that they know more than the whole private sector. No, they don't. So it was critical to, to be able to apply the same approach to address the new emerging needs. Hope that makes sense. Uh, so a few things is, uh, again, co-investments, with the partnerships, it's the understanding that we are not the solution, we're not the center, we're the colonizing force, we're, we're standing next to our partners and helping them achieve the results. And cooperation on all levels with partners, with other donors. My God, you would see how many donors starting something all over each other, just trying to identify the new niches. So you need to to be able to coordinate. So instead of duplicating efforts, you can build synergies and complement each other and do things together. And I have that word diversity. It's always relevant, but this is a very wide meaning of diversity for me. It's a diversity of voices around the table, which is as important as ever, but I think even more important than in your day-to-day -day operations. It's also the diversity of partners, looking at the new partners, looking at, okay, who we never thought of we could partner with and look at, at chances there with the new partnerships and diversity when it comes to your ideas, planning and doing with no regrets. Thank you. Uh, one. Okay. Uh, Senya, uh, we said like, just a little question here. Um, you know, we you work in market systems, and lots of us have worked in market systems. And market systems tends, in my case, I have a little critique there, to be a, a kind of overplanned approach. So you're you're telling me you're doing market systems work, and you didn't spend a year 
doing assessments and collecting data and all that, yet you pick, where did your information come from, Xenia? <laughs> because you did work with evidence, I'm sure you did. So where did it come from? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually a very uh, honest response. Yeah, of course we didn't. Because in the first... Uh, yes, we did. <laughs> people. People partners on the ground. Uh, I think that's the beauty of the approach as such. And it's also the beauty of this uh, idea of planning with no regrets. Because sometimes you cannot afford the luxury of getting all of the evidence. And especially, it's so irrelevant when your situation changes every day. But then you have your source of data on the ground. And that means for us, it's like businesses, farmers, they're also rural population. It's also the ministry, but it can be like any partners of any of your programs. So you learn to trust and rely on that data. And of course, when then the time permits, and here I have my colleague here, shout out to Victoria Gultai. She's the, the heart and core and center of our operations. And she's also the CLA advisor. So she can tell you plenty about how we do assessments and how we run with implementation while we're still doing the evidence gathering. Uh, but I think this is critical to, again, not to lose the momentum. You start planning, you start doing, no regrets. It's okay to fail. It is okay to fail, and we fail. We celebrate failure in our program big time. Uh, but then, of course, when the time permits and the security situation allowed, we started gathering information where possible. Until recently, uh, that example, we did not have any um, applications to our solicitation for a company who would do a research. They were just honestly saying that it's too early. Those people just got out of the basement and you're talking about, oh, what they need for agriculture restart. Like that's nonsense. So uh, understanding those limitations is also key, but it, it means that we still have to do something, no regrets, and then try to gather data and either proof or not. Yeah, and, and you actually have a CLA switchboard for real-time information collection and all that. They actually have that. Uh, a point where the information is collected. Uh, Sam, and now from Beirut. Okay. Oh, come on. Yes. You okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the. Okay, so Sami Hayranel. Yes. From Beirut. On to you. Thank you, Senya. Thank you for this. Uh presentation and for the incredible work that you and your team are doing and good luck with all the challenges that you're dealing with and will deal with, but I'm sure successfully. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. My name is Sami Khairallah. I am the Deputy Chief of Party and Chief Technical Officer of the USAID-funded Agriculture and Rural Empowerment Activity, which is a $57 million program in Lebanon uh, that started in two thousand five year activity actually that started from 2000, uh, June 2020 until June 2025. And ARE as an activity has also had to substantially adapt and adjust uh, its implementation and processes because of the shocks and the unfortunate uh, circumstances and events that Lebanon has gone through recently. Yeah, sorry. So uh, since 2019, uh, Lebanon has gone through a deep political and economic crisis that was characterized by uh, hyperinflation, currency devaluation, a complete collapse of the commercial banking sector, uh, in addition to a shortage in basic necessities, including uh, medicine and fuel. Um, these in the, uh, these circumstances were or these uh, th this crisis basically was triggered and exacerbated by um, a combination of corruption, mismanagement, and a number of external factors, uh, including the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, the explosion in the Beirut uh, in the port of Beirut back in August twenty twenty. Uh, 
in addition to, moreover, adding to that the war on Ukraine, which began in 2000, uh, in February 2022, which uh, compromised further food security in Lebanon uh, for much of the reasons that uh, Xenia mentioned, given that Lebanon uh, uh, imports primarily its uh, grains and vegetable oils uh, from Ukraine and from Russia as well, part of it from Russia as well. So uh, food, food insecurity was, you know, food security was really compromised. And as you can imagine, I mean, the, the impact or the, 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 that crisis that I just described uh, has had a significant impact on the agricultural sector as well. And, uh, you know, primarily because of the absence of, uh, the absence of uh, financing options, the uh, currency devaluation uh, of the Lebanese pound, basically, and uh, uh, you know all those, uh, w which led to a, uh, which made it very challenging actually for farmers to afford agricultural inputs, including uh, fertilizers, pesticides, and other planting material. So, um, adding to that, the sharp the sharp increase in the cost of fuel. Uh, you know, which added even more, which made it even more challenging for farmers to um, irrigate, operate machinery, and transport uh, produce to market. You know, so as a result of all these challenges, uh, farmers found themselves obliged to either, uh, you know, reduce their production or abandon their farms altogether. Uh, as a result of that, you know, there was a clear kind of decrease in the supply of locally grown produce in the country, which naturally has led to an increase in, uh, in, in the cost of food that, uh, that, that, you know, that made it more, uh, th that raised a real kind of food security, um, food security challenge in the country, given the rising uh, prices and which made it, you know, which made them not affordable, which made food not affordable for consumers, especially in rural areas. So uh, this this multifaceted crisis, basically, which began unfolding, uh, which began unfolding after USAID, our donors had designed and contracted uh, ARE, uh, subsequently through a wrench in. Uh, ARE's work plan, as these events as these events started to accelerate, basically in the summer of uh, in the summer of 2020, after our work plan had been kind of finalized and approved. So what we had to do is we we rapidly uh, adapted our response and made uh, made changes at three different levels uh, in the on the project in order to remain relevant and be able to achieve the anticipated program's result. So primarily, or first, at the contractual and compliance level, we rapidly engaged and started negotiations with our donors in order to uh, adjust the activities, uh, key objectives, and corresponding results framework in order to remain relevant uh, and given the, change or cir the changing circumstances. So that was, you know, that we engaged rapidly in that, and then we uh, we foresaw a bit, you know, the sub, you know, in terms of supply chain and in terms of procurement planning, we uh, also engaged with our donors and requested sought their approval on multiple waivers uh, in order to uh, to be able to streamline our procurement of restricted uh, commodities, goods, and commodities. Uh, as uh, and not have to waste time afterwards as uh, you know as the project is under implementation second uh, at the program support and uh, at the operational and support uh, at support end level we restructured our technical team and diversified our short term technical assistance bench in order to uh, increase and diversify our uh, our technical capacities um, and this basically uh, led to a more thorough, I would say, due diligence processes in the selection of partners and businesses that we work with and has uh, increased our programming quality and shortened, uh, shortened the, the lead times between project identification, design and implementation. 
uh, and has increased substantially our uh, interventions throughput and programming quality. And uh, in addition to that, we also we commensurately uh, increased our uh, program support uh, bandwidth by uh, by also diversifying and increasing our you know primarily our grants and procurement team members uh, teams. Uh, third and finally, uh, at the program design stage, we we launched two parallel funding tracks uh, that allowed us basically to continue a focus on MSME competitiveness and development, uh, which were in the initial kind of work plan, while at the same time giving us the flexibility to address food security, uh, the, the, the rising kind of challenges in food security and addressing food insecurity in the country. The first track, uh, the first track aims to uh, aims to uh, support uh, MSME competitiveness by primarily working with champion firms as well. In this case, by these champion firms, what we refer to as champion firms are stakeholders, businesses that are prominent and strategic stakeholders within their value chains that have uh, strong upstream and downstream linkages, and that are. Um, and basically what you did is we helped them access uh, primarily market opportunities, whether at the export level or locally through import substitution. And I have to point out here that this kind of support, this work happened uh, with a complete absence of any governmental support or other regulatory or effective business enabling environment. So I would say that ARE support uh, you know, was critical in de-risking these investments and these opportunities in order to help you know, these businesses achieve uh, achieve a good potential. Uh, the second the second track that we launched aimed to improve livelihoods primarily through uh, increasing agricultural productivity. And what we did there is um, is basically increasing uh, increasing productivity by uh, decreasing cost of production and uh, decreasing cost of production uh, through the introduction of new technologies. Uh, so through the distribution of agricultural inputs and through technical assistance and trainings, basically, to farmers. And basically, the idea behind the second track was to get the food production system going again. So uh, in a way to try and uh, secure uh, food production again at, at a more competitive and at a better uh, affordable and accessible prices. So, in order to achieve the intended development and and uh, intended development and market impact uh, that uh, under both tracks that I mentioned previously at the enterprise competitiveness level and at the food security level, ARE introduced new approaches and adapted technologies at various stages of the value chain. So, uh, at the primary production level. Uh, we introduced modern greenhouse, uh, modern right-sided greenhouses, single span or multiple span that increased vegetable farmers' productivity by 20 to 25 percent. Um, we also piloted a uh, forage intercropping production system in uh, fruit orchards and on terraces that uh, basically aimed to uh, diversify farmers' crops and increase uh, productivity and revenues per per, uh, uh, per square meter, and at the same time, uh, to, that that enabled us to uh, to produce uh, the now prohibitively expensive uh, sources of forages, especially in rural areas. We have also uh, we have also uh, supported the production of a very important forage in Lebanon, uh, alfalfa, that you know probably uh, you know uh, everybody knows here. So that at at scale in the Bika Valley, by the introduction of a comprehensive uh, agricultural system, modern equipment, and uh, improved logistics, basically. Moving upstream the value chain at the product, at the processing level, we also introduced food uh, quality standards and certification programs in order to improve uh, uh, food quality and quality of production to enable uh, agricultural firms and food processors to access export markets, higher value export markets, basically, and generate uh, uh, the highly, uh, highly needed uh, fresh 
foreign currency, basically. And uh, another example of a value chain upgrade uh, to improve the supply chain and access to market uh, includes the support of the establishment of a certified um, of a certified grapevine uh, seedlings uh, for the production of indigenous uh, indigenous uh, grapes for wine production. Uh, this uh, this project was the first of its kind in Lebanon. So the production of certified seedlings that are true to type and disease free, uh, and especially given the, in, the the increasing uh, demand by local wineries for these indigenous wines. So through this uh, the establishment of this nursery, we're now ensuring a consistent supply of uh, planting material that are disease free and true to type for uh, those wineries. And finally, um, in order to guarantee a fair uh, and sustainable business relation between farmers and uh, buyers, we rolled out a contract farming, uh, we applied basically a contract farming uh, component uh, throughout you know, all the value chains that we worked with in order to secure a consistent uh, supply and consistent quantity and quality, I would say, of raw materials uh, for the businesses, while at the same time safeguarding incomes for farmers. Now, uh, these uh, approaches and adaptations that, uh, that I just described earlier, and that the program applied during the times of shock, uh, have, have led to a number of transformations uh, at, at the firm level, and in some cases at the sector level as well. So first, um, our intervention or ARE's inter intervention at the alfalfa and the alfalfa value chain has led to an increase in production of 6,000 tons, uh, 6,000 tons, which fully, uh, uh, which fully substituted imports at the country level, and has now is now uh, you know providing a local source of uh, you know cheaper and nutritious forage that, as I said, have become very expensive for most dairy herders and dairy farmers to be able to afford. Second, uh, the support to the wine sector has uh, led to an, incre an annual increase in production of uh, around 200,000 bottles uh, that, uh, uh, that, that are mostly going to higher value markets, as I said, uh, that are yielding up to 50% an incre increase in revenue uh, because of those, you know, as I said, higher, higher value markets. And this was the result of that targeted value chain approach targeting indigenous wines, uh, which, I mean, uh, which has... Uh, which which has allowed these these wineries to tap into new markets and to achieve higher higher returns. Uh, moreover, uh, more than we have more than seventy farmers to date that have invested and that have installed either upgraded or installed the modern greenhouses that I spoke about, which led to the production of uh, around a minimum of three hundred tons of fresh vegetable produce, and we have a hundred more expected to kind of join and you know upgrade their production as well in the coming year. Moving on, uh, we have until now we have uh, you know more than 100 farmers have also signed these contract farming agreements that I mentioned, and I would like to highlight this. Um, and we have 200 more that are in the pipeline that are expected also to kind of you know sign you know engage or enter into such type of uh, uh, financing uh, mechanisms that have now uh, th that now present one of the few fi uh, alternative financing solutions in the country uh, because of uh, because now champion firms are covering the cost of agricultural inputs that these farmers would have otherwise have to pay for have to, have to ha have had to pay for in cash that they don't necessarily have primarily because of as i said the, the lack of financing options and the absence of any supplier credit as well so this is a very important one. And finally, uh, ARE's value chain approach and support to you know, value chain development, marketing uh, uh, in addition to marketing uh, uh, and, and market access has uh, led to uh, first-time exports 
of you know more than until date 10 tons of uh, pickled uh, cucumbers with 15 more containers in the pipelines that are expected to be shipped in the coming in the coming months and more than 50 containers of table grapes that have already been shipped to uh, the UK and southeast southeast Asian markets that are, uh, you know, that's also new markets for these for these firms that we've worked with. So, in summary, in summary, the shocks that Lebanon has gone through and has been subjected to have uh, severely and fundamentally, basically, challenged the agricultural sector in addition to uh, our program's ability to achieve the initially intended impact and uh, that was you know that were initially in our uh, in our mandate however uh, thanks to a rapid and adaptive uh, changes that consisted a response uh, that that consisted of uh, internal changes and outward facing changes and by working effectively with the program's resources uh, we were able to successfully uh, help agricultural businesses identify and capitalize on profitable opportunities that did not only help these businesses uh, stay afloat, but uh, these opportunities help these businesses become more competitive, generate higher revenue, and you know represent bright spots, I would say, currently in Lebanon, and provide compelling uh, evidence and incentive incentives uh, for further investment in the agricultural sector uh, against all odds. Thank you very much. Okay, quick question. Uh, one of the things that's interesting with Ari is the way you manage the relationship with USAID. You know, when we talk about responding at the in chaos, one thing that always fascinates me is they say that when you're hit by chaos, the first thing you have to do is establishment of smart boundaries. And that often boundaries in chaos, in a chaotic situation, are essential. Now, with a project, one of the key boundaries is, are the boundaries set by a USAID contract? And usually we'll say, well, that's not conducive to reacting to chaos. But in this case, I mean, you seem to have had a positive relationship with USAID and the boundaries that come with the USA contract. You made them work for you. Can you expand just a little bit on that very quickly? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Jean-Michel. So, you know, as you, as you said earlier, by our uh, friend General Son Tzu said, <laughs> in the midst of uh, chaos, you know, uh, there is also opportunity. And I guess what we what we were able to kind of showcase and show to USAID that these opportunities exist. And I guess the key to unlocking these opportunities and to that effective uh, work relation with USAID that, you know, uh, that can sometimes be a pretty, um, pretty difficult maybe to work with, but we were able to establish uh, trust uh, from the onset of the project hit a few uh, a few successful uh, uh, I would say uh, a few successful projects from the and achieve uh, results rapidly from the get-go and uh, showcase these opportunities which kind of build that trust and we were able to rapidly and because of all the changes that I also mentioned we were able to kind of build on that trust and that turned into basically a, a virtuous cycle I would say Did invest a lot in conformity. Still, I mean, you did you were there some trade offs in terms of rigor? Or as I said, we if anything, the rigor was more uh, reinforced. I would say in this case, whether through uh, the the more thorough uh, due diligence processes, because at the end of the day, you need you need good partners to especially on the on the competitiveness side, on the on the on the SME development side, you need serious partners that are driven and and want to achieve results in order to uh, in order to yield positive outcomes to the project and that kind of we were uncompromising on that on on the quality level and on the on the uh, on ensuring that we are working with with the best of the best basically and 
while while helping those that are in between to kind of build their capacity uh, to to get them to the needed to a higher uh, level. Thanks a lot. That's like a almost textbook example of how to use a boundary, you know, to filter and and maintain coherence through programs. It's not my fault. It, it's in my contract, <laughs> and and it helps you actually uh, select and reorient your program. I mean, thanks. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Thanks, everyone. And now, okay, from the Horn of Africa, we have Jebi. So let's see, can we can we just move the slide? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Jebi, what's in Bebo? Yes, yeah, just here. Do you want me to go through it? Okay. No? Hi. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'll move this side. Okay. If you want to. It's okay. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Chebiwot Sumbewa. Uh, feel free to call me JB. Sometimes people have a hard time saying uh, Chebiwot. Um, so um, um, I'm working currently in Kenya, uh, running a cross-border activity, which is, uh, you know, uh, about five countries. Actually, we have five bilateral missions of uh, Kenya, uh, Uganda, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and uh, Somalia. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, activity. Uh, USAID has made investments in this uh, cross-border region for, I think, over 20 years. Um, so this is the, the newest iteration, and there's been a huge shift uh, towards resilience uh, programming. And the aim of this activity is to reduce uh, the dependency on uh, humanitarian assistance for the Horn of Africa region. So... Um, I've had the privilege of uh, being chief of party of previous uh, iterations uh, of this activity. Somewhere in between, I left and then came back again. So I think this is why USAID actually uh, decided that I could be chief of party of, of the activity. Uh, it's a very interesting region, very rich, uh, both in culture, very rich uh, in terms of resources, but it has a serious um, uh, limitations in, in terms of uh, struggling with the different uh, issues, uh, including drought, um, and at the same time, more recently, um, uh, the Al-Shabaab uh, influence. Um, so it was. We started in January of 2022 uh, with a very well laid out program on how we were going to implement this activity. It was uh, innovative in many ways for USAID because uh, USAID determined that we were not going to be prescriptive this time as we implemented this activity. We were going to leave the governments, the local governments, the local organizations to plan out and, and, and create their own ideas on what was going to uh, work for them. And uh, so I also thought that was quite uh, an, an interesting approach because previous approaches were very prescriptive. And then the next one was also uh, that the LDOs, the local development organizations, were uh, going to implement this activity, activity exclusively. So we did not have the opportunity for any kind of direct implementation. Everything was to be handled by the, uh, the LDOs. So I think even for Chemonics to win this bid really had to demonstrate that reality that uh, we, we were going to leave everything to the local organi uh, organization. But somewhere, just as we were setting up the activity, uh, we had to step into the drought situation. The drought situation was really critical because um, it was the worst drought situation, I think, in over 40 years uh, for this region. And uh, we were faced with the, uh, the, the, the fact that we were even struggling to implement. There was a time we even had, um, uh, we had to intervene uh, through an assessment. But even as people were sitting there uh, trying to give um, their 
responses to uh, an interview that was talking about issues relating to conflict, the community kept saying, but that's not really our priority. We, 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 you know, the drought is what is our priority. So the, it, it was clear that the pivot was absolutely necessary. But the question for us was, USAID kept saying, you, you are not a humanitarian organization. You are going to protect development gains in this crisis. So the question was, what, what, what is protect uh, development gains in a humanitarian uh, crisis? And that was the question that we had to address uh, uh, immediately. So the, the pivot came as a result of uh, funding that remained from Ukraine. So they say that there was some funding that had been availed from Ukraine and now was being pushed to the Horn of Africa. And uh, so that, that, that really was our, our, our role. So at this are just a few statistics that I thought would have been interesting for you to understand just how uh, the situation, how critical the situation was. Um, I'm not going to get into them, but what's interesting is the, the fact that there was right square into the, the five countries that we were intervening in. And we were talking about huge losses in terms of very acute levels of malnutrition, you know, over 8.9 million uh, livestock uh, died within um, a span of uh, about two years. Um, we are talking about huge losses in terms of water and water access. Um, you know, we, we, there was a huge shift in terms of you know who is intervening in within the family setup, for example, uh, where a lot of the older people were now left to take care of children, as others had to leave to look for the the, the remaining grazing uh, land and grazing opportunities. We had also serious situations around protection for the women and girls who were now uh, exposed to gender-based violence, or even some of them having to be married off at a very early uh, age, just because. You know the family was not able to manage this, and you know it's it really is severe. I have prior to coming to Camonix um, and and this activity, I was intervening in uh, you, you know the same uh, drought situation in the Horn of Africa, and this is it's, it's really depicting a, a genuinely serious uh, situation. The next slide. So what was interesting with this intervention was that as we were smack into uh, the intervention for drought, then the rains came. And this time the rains came because we had four seasons without rain, uh, four seasons or four years actually with uh, without rain or very limited rain. And then suddenly we were faced with floods. So although we had programmed for drought, then suddenly we had to program again uh, for floods. So the water came, but it again, even caused greater destruction because if you've been in uh, pastoralism or agricultural uh, agriculture is that rain uh, during droughts is actually worse than the drought itself. So the last picture there shows, you know, the animals that had died in between their the livestock that have uh, we was lost just because they were they drank excess water and you know as a result um, they died and then these are camels that were facing uh, the drought then suddenly uh, you know they have uh, they have water and then it's excess again um, so this um, so what really happened for us is is to ask the question of how. Um, how the shock and how we had to shift uh, as, 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 as a program. So number one was to look at ourselves as not humanitarian organizations, but as development, uh, the development complement of uh, the humanitarian as assistance that was ongoing, which was provided by BHA and other uh, support. And so what, 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 what does protecting development uh, gains really look like? And it was looking at the low-lying fruit. What do I mean by this? Looking at low-lying fruit in terms of partnerships, the bringing together the technical team and the technical expertise uh, that were low-lying. So we began to look at what had USA done in these uh, countries or within these regions uh, and build on that, build on all, also other um, uh, programs uh, aside from USAID. 
and 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 networks. So looking at what the coordination networks for drought uh, were like and engaging it with them as quickly as possible. Then the third uh, low-lying fruit was also what were those activities that we would implement on a very short-term basis that would help us achieve the results uh, that we wanted? Um, so I think th those were um, some of the immediate actions we had to take. Um, of course, we had to shorten processes. We didn't have the opportunity for RFAs uh, to, to, to engage and intervene. So just asking, you know, even single sourcing a lot of uh, the support that we, we, we stepped into providing. Um, so the, the rapid in-kind support and where we were not able to give the grants uh, directly, we determined what kind of in-kind support we would uh, be able to uh, initiate. So I, I think these were huge lessons learned for us in terms of... Um, USAID's expectation, you know, we, we determined at an early stage that uh, even though this was a, a crisis, USAID would not look look at it later on as as, as a crisis. Uh, and we people tend to forget some of these shocks, especially for the Horn of Africa. It's you know it's it's almost like a forgotten matter, but of course for the community it's not. So of course we knew that USAID um, procurement policies and rules would still. Uh, be required uh, to be engaged and we couldn't bypass uh, uh, those. So I would say that uh, we looked at ourselves in terms of how we would complement um, the, the, the humanitarian uh, organizations. We began to understand who the partners were uh, and who we'd engage on very close and quick uh, response. And then again is the the low lying activities in this sense were the diversification for some of the incomes that uh, the the women especially the most vulnerable who were the women and girls and uh, the youth and we had a huge number of pastoralist dropouts there was a, a a big a large movement of people from the pastoralist uh, areas towards the urban uh, and preparing for that movement uh, into urban areas and what does it mean when women and youth uh, will move into the, the urban areas when they have been depending on uh, pastoralist uh, livelihoods. So again, uh, in terms of access to information was a lot of dependency on uh, the coordination platforms uh, that the governments and the local governments had initiated. So in Kenya, for example, we have the, the, uh, the the NDMA, um, that's the National Drought uh, Mitigation uh, Authority. Um, then, so this is just a, a picture of an example of some of the young people who were previous pastoralists, but now began to look at other opportunities within the urban areas. So um, the, here is an example of some of the brick making uh, activities. Um, we focused on, you know, fishing, for example, uh, as, a, as an alternative uh, livelihood. We looked at beekeeping. Uh, we looked at um, uh, other small scale commerce uh, that the communities could engage with. Um, and also looking at rapid um, um, technologies, technologies that could be uh, engaged with at a rapid uh, pace that didn't ex expect, for instance, um, very um, complex um, methods, uh, simple, simple, like the, the, the example of the brick making one was is, is one of them. Then the other one is really looking at cross-border uh, collaboration. Now, because we are talking about different governments, one action in one country may not apply to another. And so the, the, the collaboration at the border locations was critical for us. Um, so so these these are some of the um, uh, opportunities we had um, we explored. Um, so one of the interesting um, so in in terms of the looking at the some of the lessons learned, um, we realized that 
one of the things that provided us an uh, uh, an opportunity to pivot very quickly was the fact that we had a facility. We had a shock mitigation uh, response uh, facility you know, inbuilt into the program. So I think this is a good lesson, is that in, in this kind of context, um, this kind of uh, pre-planning uh, for the possibility uh, of, 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 of a shock uh, coming up. So we were able to work using the shock response mechanism um, and so that allowed us to pivot easily. The other one is also um, is you, you know we had a good inventory of potential partners. Uh, we had done a landscape mapping, fortunately around the time when we were intervening. So with this um, inventory of local development uh, organizations, we were able to uh, pivot uh, quite uh, quickly. Uh, we also used the drought mitigation. Um, response as as a, to our advantage we collected a lot of information and we use that information to our advantage in terms of uh, setting up baselines remember by this time we had not actually intervened in our core business uh, so we used that uh, opportunity uh, to to collect as much information and in determining who what are the areas what is the data we are looking at the population that we could actually uh, target into into our long term uh, activity the Lesson, the other lessons learned also is what we realized is that when we went into meetings with um, the local government, they kept telling us, you know, we want you to intervene on a humanitarian basis, but this was uh, not possible. But it was only later on that the same governments and local governments and local uh, communities uh, appreciated the, the pivot that we had uh, made uh, on, you know, and and one of the things we discovered is that because there were many pastoralist dropouts, just because we focused on development and not humanitarian assistance, when the um, the people were no longer able to undertake pastoralism, we were the people who captured them. At at we were the receiving end. So the fact that we we were able to get the youth to do brick making, the fact that we could. Um, use existing USAID fishing uh, programs just to uh, to pivot meant that we were we were at the receiving end for the pastoralist dropouts so initially even though there was a lot of tension with the the local government and the local communities but in the end they they actually praised the our response to uh, for the drought mitigation because they said we were the only program that was able to pivot towards the reality that none of them had uh, anticipated. So if you're talking about over a million people who are moving away from pastoralism, what do they do after uh, the animals uh, die, you know? Uh, so that pivot was a very good uh, approach. The fact that we, we focused on protecting development gains. So we had a lot of women now who, when they were in the urban areas, uh, they, they begin to look at what small activities can we do here? And if you, you know, put in the capital, you know, the small scale uh, business enterprise, uh, that can be a stepping stone or a starting point for that woman whose husband or whose family now no longer has the goods and no longer has the, the livestock. So it was, it was a, a, an interesting lesson. We did not expect this, that we would be, you know, later on praised that we were intervened in the right way. But I think it, it really did help uh, us. So <laughs> the last the last point, if uh, if you if I may just you know what's our what's our lesson? Really stick to your mission, even under compromise. Um, so it's evident, like I mentioned, that USAID was not going to let us compromise on our original targets. So we had to stick within our mission, even uh, looking at how are we still going to get the targets, even though it was a drought. 
uh, mitigation uh, program. And I think also the other one is that your partner's experience is your capital. The fact that we were working with people who had experience in this uh, in these locations, um, we were building on what they had already done. So we didn't have the opportunity, of course, of engaging in, in, in data collection and stuff like that. So it's our partners who had uh, who who were the the storehouse of of information. So we we really capitalized on that. Um, you know, you, yes. The other one is simplify, be be compliant, but be quick. Um, so that's always the stress relief for anyone um, pivoting. It's how do you still remain compliant and uh, but at the same time you're you're being uh, as quick as possible. And finally, is you know. You, they save the knowledge gained and the contacts you've made because I think you those contacts are going to be put into good use in future. So I hope I have not overdone it. Okay. How she managed the tension with the Unity, and how did you get you get people to coming out from that? Hi. 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 Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So I was asking her how she dealt with the local authorities and all that tension. You can't imagine. I really did not want to be in her place. When you go up to them, how did you manage them and and have them compliment you in the end? I mean, how did that go? Okay, I, I think it was, um, we were not expecting it. And our staff, whenever they would sit in this coordination meeting, it's a scenario where, for example, everybody is talking about the drought. We want water. We want um, we want cash, you know, give cash to the people, give, ca give water to the people, uh, give food to the people. I mean, that's all that was said in these meetings. And then here we come. Oh, no, we are into co-creation, into, uh, <laughs> we, we are here as your development partners. And, and you know, it was really stressful um, for the, and, and, and for some of the local governments, when they would see us, they would get excited. It's like, oh, somebody has come up to, to, to support us. And then when you sit down and lay down your, oh, no, we are here on natural resource management. We are here on livelihood expansion. We are here on peace building and social cohesion. And they would bang their tables and be like, no, this is not what we want. I mean, you, you what's wrong with you development uh, guys? I mean, can you be like the BHA guys? They told us the other day they would be bringing in truckloads of water. You know, they'll help us to truck water. And that's, there, there was nothing else they would focus on. So it was a real embarrassment uh, for uh, my staff to be going into these meetings on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, sometimes two times a week. And just, you know, that this is all we can do. This is, uh, this is of course, in the end, we just slap it on USAID and say, ah, the donor would not allow us. The donor will not allow us. But you could see, and, and I, I really mentioned earlier on, on uh, an assessment we began to do. Uh, Rebecca, I think you remember uh, uh, political economy analysis. That's imagine that's that's the assessment we are getting into social network analysis, and we would get people to sit in in you know in this um, focus group discussion, and you know we are asking issues on politics, we are asking issues on social co connection, social, co and then people are like, the people half the people even there were like, why are you people asking these questions? I thought you were coming to ask us about our needs and stuff like that. So uh, really responding to the needs of people. Uh, this is the first time I actually realized a, a genuine disconnect between some of the things we do and what's really happening on ground. But we stuck our guns and we didn't expect this. But the reality was one of the things that the same local governments were beginning to face is the large influx of people in the in the urban areas. You know, they, they suddenly were no longer having animals or were very, very little. And they were now squeezed in there in, 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 the, in the local towns. And, you know, but then as he as, as the local administrators would, would come into our, our meetings and now we were uh, providing brick making equipment. We were providing beekeeping 
equipment. We were now providing uh, fishing, fishing nets, you know, and they'd be like, yeah, this is actually what we need. You know, it's like, okay, we, we, we can't, you know, these people say they can't give us the cash, but now they can give us the the, the the fishing rods on whatever the fishing nets to go and fish for ourselves with whatever resources are uh, are remaining and so this is actually i mean we start this is why my lesson learned the last slide was really stick to your your plan i mean it's it's an unfortunate situation that we were not able to meet that most immediate need but what we did was to anticipate the next need and the next need is that the, uh, how are these people now going to put money into their pockets and then um, buy the food that they could uh, 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 buy. So, um, yeah, I think that's, I, I hope you understand. Okay, question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shaver Castello with the NFA. Um, so I have, Two questions. I don't know if I'm breaking the rules, but that seems to be the theme of today is sort of breaking the rules or figuring out what to do uh, within the rules. So my first question is for Ksenia. Um, First of all, uh, yeah, my heart goes out to you and, and your team. I lived in Ukraine for a year and a half and uh, I feel like many days my heart is still there. So um, and my question is about how did you balance um, sort of that subsidy or kind of that aid situation um, with protecting the local market? So if people were asking for, you know, free seeds or fertilizer, you know, how did you do that in a way um, that you were still supporting like local agro dealers or, you know, local companies when I know, you know, international companies were even excited to kind of give away um, free free inputs? And then my my second question um, is more on the um, Horn of Africa side, kind of a, a similar question or in the same vein, were you able to influence any of the local um, donors or other implementers looking towards more early recovery or looking towards more development away from that sort of cycle of humanitarian assistance? Thank you for the questions. It's an excellent question, I can tell. It's a hard one. Uh, I think I'll answer that by expanding a little bit on what uh, Jebby was saying earlier. And this is also a balance between the humanitarian assistance and development aid. Uh, by giving that example that I skipped for the sake of time is one of the ways how we built our response initially was instead of like throwing seeds at farmers that we didn't even know if they need it, we invested in redeveloping of the logistics routes. In a very primitive way, for instance, roads were destroyed, but we still needed to get to those vulnerable communities. So we invested not with a private company, but with an NGO of uh, association of communities. So we basically took on their risk and partially financial burden of administrating those logistics routes and without creating that ecosystem that serviced the affected areas. With that ecosystem, we had them crowding in. We had communities from the safer territories that were delivering humanitarian assistance. Some of the trucks we know were used for getting children out of the occupied territories, which they never told us, we never asked, but you know, good cause needs to happen. Uh, then, after that, we had crowding in of private companies that were willing to come and co-invest and donate seeds. Uh, the way how we then distributed the seeds, again, we didn't do that as a development program. The donations went directly to the association that managed that logistics and made it possible to deliver the seeds. They collected the needs from the communities, and that was... Uh, targeting the households, so that's uh, not your commercial production. And then later on, I'll just finish the example, we had other crowding in of like multiple commercial companies that donated directly, and that through that association, there was a more of a coordinated effort of distributing the inputs. Uh, and then the latest achievement was that uh, the largest private post operator, uh, it's called Nova Posta, they also uh, joined that sort of ecosystem and do deliveries for free. So that's a kind of cool example of private sector engagement with really 
no private sector investments on our side. Uh, with the distribution of seeds uh, directly into the businesses, I think this is where our portion is not that significant. So we try to offset the costs of inputs by uh, providing about 30% of Ukrainian small producers with seeds and fertilizer, but we never did it at the like 100%. So we made sure that we would cover up to 25% of uh, their need. So if they stayed in farming, they would still go and purchase the inputs. And on the grand scale of things, the cost of uh, the sowing campaign in Ukraine is billions, and we spend a couple of millions. So that really does not distort the market. Uh, the additional benefit was the savings from the um, from the procurement that was uh, done in kind, and plus the savings on the VAT, which is 20%. So we actually managed to save 30% on uh, what otherwise the farmers would spend if they purchased uh, themselves. I uh, hope that answers the question. And Yeah, so in terms of, um, yeah, so the question was, were we able to influence other donors um, from the cycle of humanitarian um, support. Uh, it's, uh, what I would say is that um, the local governments really uh, began to push for this, um, asking the, the other local development organizations to prioritize development um, and actually use uh, the CBCR activity as an example um, and b began pushing for people to move away from just giving people cash or, or, or the immediate uh, support. So I wouldn't say so much that we were the ones who, um, you know, were pushing for other donors, but I think it was the governments themselves uh, pushing for better support from uh, the development uh, actors. And even, and I think even during the coordination meetings, because we depend a lot on coordination, um, we would see the the government saying, you know, do it like CBCR. These guys didn't step in with humanitarian assistance, but now the human the need for humanitarian assistance has has diminished. But they are the ones who re still remain with us uh, after the the humanitarian assistance. So push they they tended to push um, now the local de uh, development organizations to have a different perspective and i think that's that's the lesson learned even for us is that even as we are learning it i think other organizations are also learning that this is probably a better approach that even in the midst of crisis, uh, the attention towards development should not cease. Um, and, and I think they have been pushing for this, this agenda. We pushed for it even without knowing it. It wasn't our plan initially. We were like still still within a setup phase of, of, of the activity and, and at the same time uh, dealing with a crisis. But in hindsight, this is also what I'm learning myself. As as the best approach, but coming from a humanitarian perspective, also I it, 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 I'm learning it also as 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 a way forward for me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, Benjamin Mudiwa for uh, Chemonix Zimbabwe. You can call me Ben. Thank you again for sharing your experiences with regards to building resilience for farmers' households to the different scenarios you have shared with us. My question goes to JB first. I do have enough questions for all of you. I listened with great interest when you were talking about the youth involvement in terms of uh, diversification, uh, how they are involved in uh, brick laying uh, projects. And I want to learn more from you how you've managed to involve the youth, especially in the five African countries in different uh, projects. How, at what level were they involved at and uh, which other value chains were the youth involved in? And talking of the market systems approach, at what nodes, inner nodes were they involved? I'm asking that question because I want to learn and perhaps apply that to our country context project implementation level, involvement of youth at what level. And thanks, Sami. You mentioned through your intervention um, that uh, vegetable production actually increased per square meter from 20 to 25%. Uh, percent. And thank you for quantifying that. 
could you perhaps if you do have the information also quantify how does that translate with regards to net incomes talking of incomes um what does that translate to and uh, lastly senior you made a very profound statement to me when you said um, you celebrate failure perhaps you could qualify that for me for my uh for my learning thank you so much yeah i hope i got your question right if i didn't uh, please remind me on some so in terms of the youth uh, remember these are cross border um populations so it's not necessarily you know going further into and i'm sorry that i don't have the map uh but it's uh, the borders the horn of africa northern uh borders of Kenya, Uganda, going into South Sudan, Ethiopia, and then uh, Somalia. So we are not talking about very about, although the cross border populations, you know, there are there are many, but we are not going internally into um, the the insides of 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 each country. And uh, the reason being that these are quite unique uh, populations. Um, they are marginalized you know they are quite remote uh, locations so you know they tend to be left out of the development agendas of each of their countries um but in terms of uh, bringing the youth um th- th- this was a-, a priority for us because a lot of the youth um are uh, generally either left out or you know they don't own the um, the means you know, of 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 making you know for livelihoods um it tends to be with the older men um and 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 so the value chain areas we remember again this is this was not really our core business or 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 we had to sort of like shelve our original uh, planning to take on board for a period of about 6 to 12 months um the drought mitigation so it was just picking the 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 ones we thought we would have the quickest gains uh with um so in terms of value chains we were looking at uh, i gave an example of the bee uh, the beekeeping the the honey production supporting them to to develop new better technologies using uh, better beehives be, uh, better uh, um, honey harvesting or extracting procedures and 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 packaging also packaging uh, to some extent also um because the big the remoteness of these locations very dry uh, areas i think honey uh, honey production is one of the highest and the quickest uh, ways uh, to come up with there are some uh, that deal you know with fisheries and value addition on fisheries usaid had done some investments in um a setting up of um storage uh, devices uh, in the community for 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 fishing and so we were taking advantage by increasing the number of people who could now move into fishing uh, as opposed to pastoralism um as 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 a way to to uh, you know for 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 livelihoods i you asked something around loans i didn't quite get it on the loans uh the, but i don't know if I got your question right but I hope that helps you to understand. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I you know So I, I get, sure. Thank you. Thank you for your question again. So basically, the upgrade of uh, the, the the greenhouse upgrades that I was talking about was basically moving from you know the standard uh, round uh, tunnel greenhouses to right sided single span or multi span greenhouse. And what this did actually is first reduce the the cost of production in terms of decreased less uh, agricultural inputs used, primarily pesticides. So farmers instead of 
spraying six, seven, eight, sometimes more times per season, they would end up spraying much less because of the greater volume uh, and better aeration and ventilation that's inside the greenhouse. So that's one expenses that are going down. Uh, plus the fixed costs that are associated with these cultures would be spread on a larger volume of production. So uh, roughly, and of course it will depend from one crop to the other and from one farmer to the other, but that uh, uh, increase in production by 20 to 25% in terms of yield has you know, led to an increased net income by you know, again 10 to 20% depending on the crops and depending on uh, the farmers. That's enough. I'll try to be quick. Yay, let's celebrate that failure. Uh, well, it's not the failure that matters. It's what we make out of it, right? Uh, so I'll try to give a very brief example and what we mean by celebrating the failure. I love everything about market systems approach because this is what it teaches. You found those partners, you've identified what you want to do with them, you pilot, right? You test your hypothesis. Uh, we had a major fail one time. But we decided, oh, we have all lots of that downstream navigation in the river and no Nobody is bringing anything up. That's such a waste. That seems like such a waste. So we piloted this huge program with businesses and barges with watermelon, upstream navigation. Awesome. Failed spectacularly because there was no money in that business. Watermelon just died in five days. But what we learned, you don't do upstream navigation in Dnieper. That was a very good lesson that saved us from investing hard money into that specific business. Uh, another benefit of failure in a shock environment is a lot of times you just don't and cannot work quickly enough, which is a beautiful thing. You know, we've faced multiple panic attacks in Ukraine. Oh, oh my God, there's no fuel. Everybody, who can buy fuel? We're like, no, no, we can't. It's a restricted com commodity. No, 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 you need to identify fuel in Europe. Bring it to Ukraine. And by the time we were like done with 20 loops going back and forth with USAID, still forbidden to purchase fuel. Businesses got it. We were done. They found it because they needed it by then. So we failed to deliver on time, which saved us a lot of trouble of distorting the market, bringing something that nobody needed in the end. So that's another type of failure, which is great. So fail everyone, just, you know, let's learn from those failures. I'll jump on in. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I do love the the fail. Fail quick <laughs> and get it over with. Um, all three of you guys really responded to the idea that you're not humanitarian organizations, but you're responding to this acute, fast need. And I'm curious about how you've balanced out the the need to to reach larger numbers than maybe initially planned, and how you determine kind of you know normally in this approach we would have gone in further depth or, you know, lower numbers, but now we need to, to reach all of these who are in a higher, higher level of need and kind of how have you managed those in different situations and, and found that balance. My response will be short. I had a slide on that. It's a balance. You have your drivers and those remain your co-investment partners. And then you have the bulk of, you know, millions of people that are affected and you try uh, those different software interventions and trying to reach higher numbers. And that depends on the need because once remain the drivers, then you have a group that uh, is affected, but also continues to be the driver of economy. And then you have this uh, majority that's just, you know, in need of help and you balance all of that. And you understand that one is impossible without the other. So, uh, thanks. I mean, again, in our case, in ARE's case, it was also a balance. Initially, it was an SME development program. Then we were asked to kind of address the food security uh, kind of challenges. We were able, I mean, again, thanks to a diverse team with, you know, the build on the experiences that that were, you know, in-house, in addition to kind of, you know, partnering with the right uh, I would say local partners in this case, local NGOs that have been engaged in food security programming to kind of capitalize on that uh, on that capacity of theirs and reach uh, you know large number of farmers at once. So uh, a mix a mix of both uh, at both levels basically. I I will agree with your last point. Really, it's uh, about um, good networking and having good uh, relations with the partners who 
have historical experience and capacities to actually reach as many people as possible, um, as opposed to going through a very lengthy process of identifying, of building capacities of those organizations to reach um, uh, many people. Um, it's it's is identifying who is able to approach this problem in, in very quickly and uh, be very responsive. So that's how we were able to reach more people. It was based really on experience of the partners. I'm breaking the rules again. I have just one remark. I want to give a shout out also to my colleague over there from another program, CAP, from Ukraine. Uh, and that's answering a question, how do you balance and reach high numbers. I think it's a great thing that uh, we work with our donors so well together that multiple programs jump on board. We build out synergetic responses. Uh, we leverage each other. If, let's say, we establish the logistics and ecosystem, we have then humanitarian aid that can use it to deliver the goods, which we had pretty much every step of our way, other programs that address other as elements, but we all work uh, complementarily with even closer coordination than before. And that's a big element to this response. All right. Um, it has to be a yes or no question. <laughs> <laughs> is lunch ready? Is lunch is ready, but so go ahead, but phrase it so that the answer is quick. Oh, wow, that's a difficult one. Go. <laughs> okay, um, but I'm willing to take... Otherwise, you can just take it private while you're eating. Yeah, but maybe for the benefit of everyone else okay. in the room. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about um, managing USAID. Um, you know, at the start of any project, you have targets, you have bell plans. So similar to Hillary's question, but especially if you had to scale down your, your targets, how did you handle that conversation with USID around value for money and, and, and the like? Um, and then lastly, seasonality of um, agricultural value chains and the need to pivot fast. How did you manage that? That's definitely not a yes or no answer. <laughs> but so, yeah, very good question. In our case, first I'll start with, with, the, with the second part of it. Seasonality was a very difficult to kind of, you know, forecast and to kind of schedule, you know, the interventions that are, you know, in different value chains with different kind of timelines. Uh, I would say that we try to be as conservative as possible in terms of, you know, projecting and forecasting, uh, you know, when the actual uh, seasonality will hit and specifically around, uh, you know, given the multiple stages that go from the project design all the way to implementation. And I have to say that our success rate was a bit more than 50%, 50-60%, but uh, uh, thankfully, I mean, the project was long enough that we would be able to capture and kind of move the results to the right, capturing the results more for the next seasons. Uh, and the project was diverse enough and working on enough, uh, on enough value chains to have uh, uh, continuously something happening and uh, uh, results uh, happening. Now, in terms of targets, I wouldn't necessarily say that we scaled down the targets. But we kind of uh, uh, we 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 changed we changed them in a way that I guess made more sense and still uh, uh, brought USAID uh, uh, the the value that they were looking for, especially as they kind of were uh, you know saw the interest and and were uh, uh, wanted to be more uh, intentional about targeting specifically in this case food security in the country, and we helped them kind of. Uh, uh, we help them, specifically our core, uh, uh, in, in their kind of justifications and in their uh, uh, rationales in kind of updating uh, whether it's the, the, the activity skew objectives or the results framework, basically, with all the targets that went to it. It was fact-based, uh, evidence-based, and I mean, there was a reality that, you know, thankfully they were reasonable enough to kind of understand and work with us on accommodating uh, in terms of, uh, you know, updating the targets and, and, and the results framework. The short answer is it's hard. Uh, second short answer is it's doable and it's great. Uh, 
couple of things went into this. USAID in this case uh, acted as a incredible partner and support, and we did it together and we worked on all the pivots. And second, it's preparation. I think uh, all of our cases are unique and you cannot prepare for a blast like that. But to the war, we were preparing, like not in our wildest dreams that we thought that the worst case scenario will play out, but we had certain pivots prepared. And let's say 10 days once everybody was like out of the active hostilities. And uh, let's say I was uh, walking through the border with my son, like in my hand. So yeah, for a couple of days we were out of it. But once operations resumed, we had a plan that we already uh, unraveled and that helped a lot. So one of my takeaways is uh, plan alternative scenarios that have opposite scenarios because everything can go wrong and different. And that was helpful. But uh, I have to say, I commend USAID on really making very quick adjustments and being very flexible uh, in terms of how we could reprogram our activity. Oh, to summarize, um, keep moving, go for the high ground, and keep in touch. Okay, so that's a little phrase. There's also where there's where there's chaos, there's opportunity. Uh, we wanted to do a little session. We're a bit too ambitious to sit around and have you crowdsource your own little Sun Tzu phrases or your marine guidelines. But I hope the session kindled that in your mind that. You know, in your own work, if you can sum up, you know, your own uh, intervention, come up with your own saying, a bit like Xenia saying, plan with no regrets. <laughs> or or when we have uh, Jebby saying, stick to your guns, but be compliant, you know. So, uh, <laughs> and be compliant. Uh, and. and and I, I would say for Sammy, it's, uh, you know, don't, you know, there is always an opportunity because, you know, with the Beirut blast, they decided to go into wine exports. We didn't go into that discussion, but there was an opportunity, which is a great exchange rate. So in any case, think about that. You know, we would have liked to hear your own words of wisdoms, your own little catchphrases and mantras that you have in periods of crisis, because they are important, I would imagine. You know, when you guys are stuck in your situations, that's what comes back to you and says, OK, we have to keep moving. Uh, so that's it. Uh, and uh, eventually, well, uh, post that on the uh, LinkedIn, and we'll set up a special group for the mantras of chaos development. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Just a quick announcement. Well, thank you, first of all, for the wonderful presentation. Um, we handed out 